won't really talk about the meandering path that got me to this role. Uh, I will talk a little bit about my Wall Street experience during the talk. Uh, right now, I'm at a company called Zora. And well, I should also say, Fighting Turn with Data is the name of a book that I'm writing. Uh, so this is kind of previews uh, from the book. And I obviously don't have a graphic designer yet, so I made that terrible <laughs> image by myself. But don't worry, we'll get a better cover before there's actually a book coming out. Um, so a little bit about Zora. Um, Zora is uh, the leading subscription management platform. I guess leading is a subjective statement, but you know we are a subscription management platform, and we have many customers on the platform, um, hopefully some of which you've heard of. Uh, what these companies all have in common is that they sell a product by subscription, um, and they're using Zora to manage the subscriptions. The way I explain Zora is to say that you want to sell a product by subscription. If you just charge everyone $9.99 a month, that's actually pretty easy. That's an easy subscription billing use case. If it's something like your cell phone plan, where you've got like a base plan, uh, multiple devices, allowances of data, allowances of other resources, then you have a very complicated subscription. And it's actually hard to get everyone's bills right and make sure that you're charging everyone. Um, so part of this is about um, charging people for you know, using your product. But it's also just about designing your subscriptions and plans, uh, making sure everyone's you know, getting the service and integrating it all with your financial back end. So I'm going to say a little bit more about three special Zora customers, because these are customer case studies in the talk today. Um, and they are generously allowing me to show you their data, um, real data about uh, their churn and the, their products. So let me briefly introduce them, because they, you know, they do this for the marketing, I guess. So Broadly uh, is a, a SaaS company. Do you guys all know SaaS or software as a service? So Broadly is a SaaS company. Uh, Broadly ensures that your business looks great online and is found and chosen by potential customers. So it helps companies manage their reviews uh, and things like that online. Clipfolio is a data analytics cloud app for building and sharing real-time business dashboards. So it's like a BI tool um, that I guess is, I don't know if it's similar to Mode that we just were kind of talking about or different. I'm not actually that expert. Uh, Versature is a telecommunications company. Uh, Versature is disrupting the Canadian, tele te Canadian telecom industry with cloud-based business communication solutions. So it's voice over IP um, for uh, mostly small businesses in Canada. In fact, all of these products are mostly used by small businesses. Um, so moving on, what is churn? Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I, I, you probably know if you're in the room, but in case not, churn means cancellation of subscriptions um, on a subscription product, or generally it can mean just anyone leaving your product. If you have any product where you want people to keep coming back, like an app or something, if they stop coming back, then you can consider that a churn. And everything I'm going to talk about today applies equally to non-subscription products uh, as to subscriptions. It's just a it's, the definitions are all clearer when we're talking about subscriptions, so I'm going to focus on, on that. Uh, the term churn originated from what's called the churn rate, which is the proportion of subscribers that cancel in a given time period. Um, so when your subscribers are canceling, you need to replace them. It leads to a turnover in your subscriber pool, and that's why they call it churn. Churn originally means to mix something. Um, churn is also now a verb. You can say the customer churned or the customer is churning. It's also a noun. Uh, make a list of all the churns from last quarter, and you know we're going to work over that list of churns. So the word has taken on kind of a life of its own. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about churn rates. Uh, in this talk. I make a report for my company, Zora, called the Subscription Economy Index. And if you want benchmarks to know what are typical churn rates in different verticals, uh, you should look at this report. Uh, but we're not really going to talk about specific churn rates of any companies in this talk, because my case study companies won't let me tell you their churn rates. It's actually very sensitive information. So we're going to talk a lot about churn. I'll just say generally, you know, we see average churn rates in the 20 to 30 percent a year. Um, I think the top 10 percent best churn rates in Zora is kind of like below 10 percent. And the top 10 percent worst churn rates in Zora have annual churn rates above 60 or 70 percent. I forget the exact number. So we see you know, all across the board uh, different churn rates. 
So what is fighting churn with data about? This is one of my kind of terrible diagrams that needs a graphic designer from the book. <laughs> but it's the mental model for what the book is about. The general situation is shown here on the left, where you have some kind of product, you have users. They're, they're using the product, and you're going to track that in some kind of data warehouse. Exactly what you're tracking depends on your situation. Um, if you actually have subscriptions, you've probably got another database that's tracking the subscriptions. So that's the situation that you come into. Uh, the goal that you want is kind of hiding here on the bottom. Uh, not a great design, but you want more retention and engagement with your customers. Retention is basically the opposite of churn. So if you say you're going to increase retention, that's the same thing as reducing churn. And you need to increase engagement. Uh, so the book is about taking the data that you've got in your subscription database and data warehouse uh, putting them together and doing a churn analysis, which we're going to see examples of. And once you've done that, you can segment your subscribers or customers into different groups and take targeted actions to try to do something um, about the churn. So the book is mostly about this analytic part, but we do talk a little, I will say something about you know, what you're actually going to do about churn. I think that's actually the, well, we're getting to that, into that on the next slide. But I like to tell people that churn is actually pretty hard to fight, and it kind of sets the context for much of the work that I've done there. Um, first of all, churn is hard to predict, and that's because much of the information that you would need to predict it well is not going to be available to you. Particularly, you don't know about people's ability to pay, you don't know what their other options are, and you don't really know what they think of your product when it comes down to it, subjectively. Even when it's completely obvious that someone's going to churn, the timing is still unpredictable. And we'll see examples when it's really obvious who's going to churn. But you still don't really know when they're going to do it. And that's probably a common experience for all of us. If you think about the last time you canceled Netflix or Hulu, you probably didn't watch something for a few months. And you were like, oh, I got to cancel that thing. Oh, I got, I got billed for it again. I got to cancel it. And the time when you finally cancel it, has to do with all these other you know, factors which a data analyst or data scientist could never really know about. Not only is churn hard to predict, it's even harder to prevent um, because there's really, well, there's no silver bullets. I mean, there's no easy ways to prevent churn in an, in an ongoing and significant way. You really have to deliver more value. Um, it's what we call like a lead bullet situation. It's like the zombies just keep on coming, and you better have a lot of lead bullets, because not, there's not just one trick that's going to do it. Or if there is one trick that improves your churn, it's probably a sign of a major product gap or a, a failure in your product design. But assuming you have have a decent product, no major bugs, you're not going to find easy fixes for churn. And I also like to point out that discounting is not a strategy to reduce churn. A lot of people in a data science course, they're given a churn data set and given an exercise. Suppose you send a discount to everyone who you predict is going to churn, you know, something along those lines. How much money would you save? But sending out discounts is not a way that real companies try to reduce churn, or it's usually not very successful. You give discounts to lure people to signing up, but there's no such thing as like a last month half off, because everyone would just take the last month half off, right? It's your last month. You might as well get half off. So it's really subverting the pricing strategy to use discounts. So what do you do? Churn is hard to fight because preventing churn is owned by the business people, and not just one kind of business person. It's owned by different parts of your organization. Uh, product creators are going to reduce churn by making a more engaging and stickier product. Marketers can help reduce churn, but it's not marketing in the sense of increasing sales. You've got to market your features, the best features of your product, to your customers to make sure that they're aware of them and taking advantage of the best features of your product. Uh, customer success and support are groups that do one-on-one -on -one interventions with customers. If it's a reactive intervention, like the customer calls and complains, then that's customer support. Customer success usually means that you're more proactive. You're designing onboarding, training, maybe even reaching out to people who you know are failing. 
Um, and lastly, account managers can work on churn by right-sizing the pricing plan for a customer. And by right-sizing, I mean getting someone on the right plan for them. It's not the same as discounting, because if you think someone's already on the right plan, you don't discount. But if you really think someone's you know, on an inappropriate plan, then you know, fine, you can you know, take a downsell rather than a uh, churn. Um, and lastly, I want to emphasize these are four different groups. They've all got their own tools as well. So if you want to do something like deploy a machine learning model, you're going to have some issues. In fact, let's go on to the next slide and talk about the role of data. So I show a little Venn diagram here of uh, sort of the three main sort of areas of data work, data science, machine learning, and data analytics. And then I'm saying fighting churn with data lives mostly in data analytics, because basically what you've got to do is test hypotheses and explain the results to these, all these different people in your company that are all going to have their different tools. The most important thing you can actually do is design the behavioral metrics, which I'm going to spend most of the time talking about in this, in this talk. Um, you can help design segments, and that's where you might get to predict churn with something like a predictive model. But the thing is, if you're predicting churn with a model, it needs to be in a means that these people understand, and it also needs to be in their tool. The sales guys are all using the CRM, the customer support people are all using Zendesk, the marketing people, they need to make their segments in um, their, their email marketing automation tool, like Marketo or MailChimp or you know, whatever you've got. So the most important thing, and what I'm going to focus on in this talk, is what I call metric design with the business people. If you have a data science or statistics education, you call this feature engineering. I don't call it feature engineering with the business people, because if you're in a software company, you've got software features, and you've got software engineers. And when you start talking about feature engineering, you can, get, you can really confuse people. So one of my themes in this is speaking the language of the business. So I'm going to do that in many cases. We're going to talk about metric design and not feature engineering, even though you can know it's the same thing. So it's your not-so-secret weapon. I mean, if you're kind of new to this field, you might not have had this experience. But really, the feature engineering can be the most important thing you do when you approach any problem. Um, you can prove interpretable hypotheses. And business people will believe it and act on it. Uh, you can do a dimension reduction that is not confusing to people. I'll show you about that in this talk. And you'll be able to accurately predict with any model, including a linear model, if you do a good job on your feature engineering. So let's talk about um, what features I'm talking about. This is converting the data in your data warehouse into summary metrics. And I'm sure many of you have done exercises like this before. This is a hypothetical example. You have user logins. And these are events that happen at any time uh, for each user. When you make a metric out of it, or what I call a metric, it means you divide the series of events into windows. And in this case, you just, I'm saying you just count them. You know, how many logins per month or for in a four-week period? If your events have additional data with them, like if they're transactions, then you could do things like the total dollar value in a particular period, or if there are duration like for watching videos or listening to music, you would do the total or the average time viewed and things like that. And I would consider these you know, just your basic metrics. And we're going to look at more advanced metrics soon. One thing I'll mention uh, to, before moving on is we do these in a staggered way. So even though you're observing behavior in, say, a one-month period, it doesn't mean you have to wait a month to update it. You make a moving window, and every day you can update you know, your one-month moving window of whatever. You update the metrics all the time. And then you're going to form a data set, which is, again, probably something many of you have already done. To form a churn data set, I want to emphasize a few points. Um, you need to make observations of both churn and renewal events. And you make these observations in advance of the event. And you make it, why do you make it in advance? Well, after someone's churned, they're obviously off your system. So they'll have all zeros, right? But right before they churn, they might change their behavior too. I'm making a hypothetical example here where a sh it's a file sharing service where you have like uploads and downloads. Before someone's going to churn, they'll probably stop uploading because they're like, eh, 
yeah, I'm done with this place. I'm not contributing anymore. But they're going to download like crazy, you know, because they're like, oh, I got to get everything, but you know, before I'm cut off. So it would be easy to detect people churning in this time when they're preparing to churn. But you actually want to go even further back than that to when they're still thinking about it. Um, and it's hard to know exactly when that is, but you just kind of figure, say it's a month to month subscription, maybe one to two weeks before the renewal, that's when you should make the snapshot. And then you, later on, you see if they're a churn or a renew. For an annual subscription, you'll use an even longer lead time, maybe one to three months before the renewal. That's when you need to look and see how are they doing. And then later on, you'll see if they're a churn. Um, and then you, you flatten that data set. This is a, you know, kind of a picture of flattening the data set. And you figure out who's a churn or not from the subscriptions. All right, so finally, after all that preparation, I think we can start looking at some actual churn analysis. So I'm, gonna, I'm showing you this technique, and it's actually the only analytic technique I'm going to present today. It was a little bit funny when uh, Peter was asking me, oh, what do you want to present? What model do you use? And I was a little bit like, um... I think I said regression, because we do use regression, but it's not really a model-driven approach that I take. These are cohort plots, um, which basically means I, t I sort the users or subscribers all by one variable and divide them into cohorts, typically deciles. And then you look at the average churn rate in each decile and just make a plot like this. So this is saying, you know, these bottom deciles of the Clipfolio's active days per month have a much higher churn rate than people who are active uh, like 20 or more days a month. I'm not showing you the numbers here, because like I said, I can't tell you anyone's churn rate. But in all of these plots, these are the tr this is the true zero, right? So when you see, you know, this churn rate here is, you know, half of this churn rate, whatever it is. And I don't even need to show you the churn rates to explain this to you because the plots look like this no matter what the churn rate is. Like I said, I've worked with companies with 1% churn rate. I've worked with companies that have 50% churn rate. These plots still look the same. And I like to show these to the, the business users because they can reproduce this analysis themselves, which is something you have, might have heard when you demonstrate a result to people in the business. They'll be like, oh, I want to reproduce that. Or who are those accounts? You say, oh, the, these accounts are hardly logging in. They'll say, who are those accounts? I want to look at those accounts. And with this kind of analysis, you just say, here you go. Here's the spreadsheet. Sort it however you want. You can reproduce this analysis 100% uh, in a spreadsheet, which is very effective talking to business users uh, and getting them to uh, you know, believe in you. So here's an example from Broadly, uh, the reviews updated per month. So updating reviews is one of the main features. And it's interesting just to make another example here where here if they get above two to four reviews updated a month, they're pretty much good. You know, and people in customer success and support, they always want rules like that. Oh, what do I have to get the users above? It can be hard in a case like this one where really it's just the more the better. I mean, I guess you could say that after around 10 days a month, they're pretty good. But it doesn't always give you a clean, oh, just above this number for them. So even though I'm not going to do a lot of uh, like modeling, there is some math in this. And one thing I wanted to point out is using a log scale scoring. Um, so scoring, I mean normalization or standardization. Again, this is like a business user lingo. I like to say scoring because they're not intimidated. When you say, oh, we're going to give everyone a score, they're like, cool. It's like baseball or basketball or something like that. You say normalization, and they're like, oh, what's that? Um, so these are cases where the behavior, there's a long tail. For example, in customers added per month for broadly, the top 10% is above 300, but you, you know, have people with practically none. For Versature, local calls per month, the top 10% seems to be above 30,000. Uh, and again, that's, that's a long tail. And when you make a score from these, uh, take the log of one plus the count for a count metric, and then just do the normal, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and then you can make these plots that look like this. Uh, and you can see, you know, it's kind of a lin this one is kind of a linear relationship in, you know, in log scale. And I also find this is a great way to introduce scoring to business people because I can actually show them these two plots and see, like, look how when you do it without the score, 
all the points are bunched up down on the left, right? But when I turn it into a score, it looks like all smoothed out. And they'll nod their heads and say, OK, yeah, that kind of looks better. And then I'll just say, so that's why we do scoring, because it makes these plots look better. And now you all know there's a lot of other reasons to do scoring, some of which we're going to get to. But it's kind of a good way to just sort of sneak in the concept you know, to business people. So let's look at some more examples. OK, account tenure is what I call the age of someone on the product, or how long have they been on your product. I don't call it the age because that's confusing with you know, the, the age of, of an individual, if it is an individual. And you, these are very typical relationships. You see the highest churn rates like in the first year, even a peak around in the cohort that includes one year, because you know, fewer people are going to churn kind of mid-year. And then over multiple years, the churn rate you know, decreases. Um, and these are kind of your standard expected uh, relationships with account tenure. They don't always look this way. There are products where churn increases with tenure. Um, it's kind of a special case, and it's not always a bad thing. I guess I can talk about that later if we have time, but let's look at some other stuff. Um, monthly recurring revenue is the amount paid per month. If you're already in the SaaS or subscription world, you probably already know about MRR, ARR. Um, so it's a slowly changing dimension or metric in that someone's MRR only changes when they switch plans, but I still calculate it as a metric you know, every week or whatever to do a unified analysis with all the other behavioral metrics. So now let's ask the trick question, does paying more cause people to churn? All right, who thinks people who pay more churn more? All right, I told you it's a trick question. Paying less, <laughs> churn more? All right, here's some data. Usually people who pay more churn less. It's not always true. It's almost always true, though. Um, and these are typical examples. I like to show real data because it's you know, going to be a noisy relationship. Also, I'll mention I'm not showing any real monthly recurring revenue. I'm only showing you the scores because I'm not here to tell you about the pricing information uh, of these companies. But these are you know, pretty typical examples where you see people who pay more are generally churning less. Now, why? The first reason is what's called involuntary churn, which means people who want to continue the product, but they can't pay. Um, so it makes sense that people who signed up for a more expensive plan are going to have less involuntary churn because they had more money to begin with, right? or they wouldn't have signed up for the expensive plan. This is especially true in business-to-business -business products, where your more expensive people probably pay 10 or 100 times your less expensive people. I know in Zora, you know, our, mo our more expensive you know, paying customers are, like, have million dollar a year contracts, and they're billion dollar a year companies. And then we've got startups who are only paying us you know, 10,000 a year, and those startups just go out of business. But the billion dollar corporations don't. But this, the involuntary churn doesn't entirely explain um, why more, higher MRR is associated with less churn. Um, it's really about correlation uh, and not causation. So here's an example of a little correlation in churn analysis from Versature. Um, MRR is positively correlated with the number of devices the amount of domestic calls and the amount of local calls. Now, that shouldn't be surprising because high MRR means they're a bigger company. They have you know, more devices and more users. So when you look at these things in churn, it's actually, well, they're all related to churn. So churn is lower among people who do all these things. Um, and that is a good way to think about why MRR you know, is correlated with less churn, you know, not more churn, um, because they're just bigger users overall. They have all these good things going for them. So talking more about correlation, um, when you look at a SaaS product, they're typically tracking dozens or you know, even hundreds of events, um, usually more events than I, I want to deal with for this kind of analysis. And when you look at a big correlation matrix of all of the um, different events, it generally looks like this. And there'll be a big hot spot uh, when you sort it. Um, there'll be a big hot spot of all the most common events you know, on the platform. And then you get these other blocks of correlated activity related to other things. So this is from Clipfolio. The main block is all metrics of dashboard viewing and editing. Um, and then these lesser blocks are more specialized. So working with templates are all the metrics in this block. This block has to do with uh, bringing in new data sources. 
um, et cetera. So you're always going to have these big groups of correlated stuff um, in a SaaS product. So what do we do about it? Um, now we're talking about dimension reduction. And the problem with dimension reduction is that it's hard to explain. If you've ever had the pleasure of trying to explain PCA to uh, business people, I don't know, anyone? It's not fun. They, they just don't get it. Um, and it is actually, I, PCA is kind of confusing. <laughs> so here's another method that I've used, hierarchical clustering, also known as agglomerative clustering. You basically just take the correlation mat matrix, you find the two most correlated things, and you merge them by a uh, weighted average of the scores. And you use sum of squares weighting to preserve the variance. Uh, it's similar to PCA in that respect. Recalculate your correlations, and you just repeat that, me that method uh, until either all the remaining correlations are below a threshold or you achieve a target number of blocks. And this is actually how I produced uh, this correlation matrix, by doing the agglomerative clustering and resorting. Now, is this really a dimension reduction method? Well, I like to show these plots which compare hierarchical clusters to PCA. Um, so on the left, here is the loading matrix for the first six uh, principal components from PCA. And on the right is the loading matrix from hierarchical clustering. And what's very interesting about these comparisons is the groups that were found by the hierarchical clustering are really prominent uh, in the PCA loading. So this, you know, this hot block in the PCA, that corresponds directly to the second block found through agglomerative clustering. And similarly, for all these other things going on in the PCA loading matrix, they're very similar to the hierarchical clustering. So yes, this is a real dimension reduction method, which does a lot of the same thing that PCA does. And it's really easy for people to understand. So when I show business people that correlation matrix, and say, look, all these behaviors are correlated. Well, sometimes you have to explain to them what correlation means first. But after you do that, you can show them the heat map. They like that. It's like you know, cool colors, and it actually shows them what they already know. And then they'll accept plots like this, where I say, OK, I made an average score on the dashboard viewing and editing metric group, and it you know, has this relationship to churn. And so this is, again, a very natural way to introduce dimension reduction to the business as well, because you've kind of built up the context about churn reducing behaviors. Oh, but these behaviors are related, so we'll look at them all together. And then this is the template and metrics group. That was the second block of related behavioral metrics um, also for, these are all examples from Clipfolio. So you can you know, do this simple dimension reduction. You should do this um, because the behaviors are correlated. I mean, you're the data person and you understand all this. So even if you don't tell them everything about correlation, you at least need to understand it. OK, but what about differences? Now, what's interesting about PCA in comparison to hierarchical clustering is the PCA matrix has all this information about what are the interesting differences, like what things tend to go together, and then it makes additional information out of the differences between the normalized variables. That's cool, but it, it's really hard for people to understand. So how do we? What else can you do? I say I take this from the Wall Street playbook, and I'm going to take a short detour into company analysis, where you have a related problem. If you want to analyze a company, there are many measures of the company, but they're all correlated. The share price, the earnings, the dividends, the number of shares, these are all big numbers for Apple and Google, and they're very small numbers you know, for like a penny stock or you know, any small company. So there's a lot of correlation in financial data. So so what financial people do is they look at ratio metrics, like earnings per share, I'm sure you've heard of, uh, price earnings, uh, price divided by earnings, dividend yield is the dividend divided by the price. So, for, so you, these types of metrics make companies of different sizes comparable. If you want to know if the stock is expensive or cheap, you look at the price earning ratio, not just at the price, right? So you can take this trick and use the same thing in your own metrics. Um, OK, one note I like to make is how intuitive this is. 
I, no one's ever explained this to me. So if you study cognitive psychology and can tell me why this is true, I'd like to know. But ratios are really intuitive. Like if you say miles per hour, we all know that what that is. But if you make the unit of a mile hour by multiplying miles times hours, you're kind of like, huh? And the business users are too. So humans just seem to have a natural understanding of ratios, but not for unit multiplication. Um, and I don't know why that is, but we definitely take advantage of it by making ratios that people will understand. So from the work I've done, I summarize it as uh, three key ratios to look for when you're designing metrics related to churn. Uh, utilization is actually the most common one. Whenever there's a budgeted resource, you want to look at what percent of it people are using. And everyone's actually already doing that already, because if you have a budgeted resource, you want to know who's near the limit. What's not so common is to look at metrics of efficiency and value. And I would def define an efficiency metric as any kind of complete or success rate, and a value metric as any ratio where one of the things is the cost. So it's either cost divided by use or use divided by cost. And I'll make examples of these um, right now. Um, here are some value metrics for versature, and this goes back to the question of, do people who pay more churn less or more? Well, now we can actually see that people who pay more churn more when it's price per call. So people who pay more are generally making more calls, but when you actually normalize what they're paying by the amount of calls that they're making, then you see the real relationship. Yes, people who pay more churn more. Same, this is dollars, uh, calls per dollar, it's you know the opposite ratio. Um, I don't really have a strong belief or feeling about which one you should be using, but if you want to see the one where uh, paying more means more churn. You put the, the, what they're paying in the numerator. Um, also, here's the MRR per device. Not as strong a relationship, but you know, still a real relationship, I'd say, here. And what's interesting, if you look at these correlations down here, um, is that MRR you know, uh, is correlated with things like you know, the, the number of device and total calls per month. Uh, but it's not very correlated. You know, if you look at this MRR per call, it's not super correlated with anything except it's reciprocal, right? So this is actually like uh, you are reducing the dimension and making new features here which are not as well correlated with the others. Uh, okay, so let's look at another example. This is a success or failure case. Um, this is from Broadly. So they want reviews, right? But are they good reviews or bad reviews? So here, the customer promoter per month is the number of you know, positive reviews per month. And as you would expect, the more positive reviews, the less churn, right? But what about detractors? Those are bad reviews. If you look at customer detractor per month, you also see, oh, look, more bad reviews, less churn. Does that make sense? Well, it does from the sense of correlation that if you get a lot of reviews, you're going to get a, a lot of bad reviews. You want to see the real impact of bad reviews, you have to look at the detractor rate. Um, so here you can really see that if you're getting a high proportion of detractors um, above 15 or 20 percent, it's actually bad news. And so that's the relationship you were expecting to find with detractors, but you don't find it when you just look at detractors alone. Um, and last example, well, I should want to add for this, this also technique applies for almost any situation where you want to know like what is better, one feature or another, or one type of content or another, because you're generally going to find your power users consume a lot of everything and they don't churn as much. And your, you know, your weak users are going to have low numbers on everything and they'll churn. But you have to look at the actual ratio or you know, the relative difference between the features with a percentage or some kind of ratio. And that's how you can answer questions about you know, which one is better. And they don't always look this good. I mean, look, obviously, I took some really great examples to put in the presentation. You'll, see, you'll do this exercise sometimes, and you'll find no relationship. Oh, well, you know, move on. You know. But if you can find a few key relationships like this, that's what really makes the difference uh, in your churn analysis. Okay, lastly, utilization. I put this one last because almost everyone has a utilization metric already. And the result is basically what you would expect. Um, you've got active users, of course. The more active users, the better. The number of seats is sold is not a super strong relationship, but it does kind of show, okay, the big customers who have really a lot of seats, there is a you know, somewhat 
lower churn rate, reasonably convincing difference. Um, but you want to see a really clear and strong relationship, you look at the license utilization. Um, and don't ask me why some people have more than 100% license utilization. They just do, you know, <laughs> in some companies. Uh, so, but again, this is, it's the same concept with license utilization. You can make a metric which is not so correlated with just the size or the number of people in the company. So that's actually all I'm going to try to say for today. Uh, fighting churn is not easy. It requires data people to actually make examples that business people can understand and really transfer knowledge to them, which is why I consider this more of like a data analytics task than like a data science uh, task. Uh, Well-designed metrics allow you to analyze and predict churn in an interpretable way. And the most important tip I'm trying to communicate in today's talk um, is about making ratios of simple metrics. They're usually interpretable as an efficiency measure, uh, a utilization measure, measure, or a value measure. And they have this effect of letting you kind of sneak in you know, dimension reduction uh, without your users getting confused. So thank you. I did mention I'm writing a book. Um, the book will be available for online access in in June, I have a website, I don't know if you can see it down there, fightchurnwithdata.com, where I'm posting uh, blog posts made from the, the material I'm preparing for the book. And also, you guys can feel free to reach out to me by any of these means, my direct email, uh, connect on LinkedIn, uh, follow me on Twitter, and all the source code that I, that I use to produce uh, these uh, examples and everything that's going to be in the book is all in my public repo on GitHub. Do I have a minute or two left? Well, I can take questions, but I also say there's so, there's so many things I didn't have time to tell you about. It was really hard deciding, you know, what is the one most important thing I can put into a 40 minute talk. I really think making, you know, those kind of ratio metrics is the most important trick I can convey to you in a short time. Uh, other interesting things are, well, there's a lot of ways to calculate churn. We go into details of that in the book. There's more kinds of advanced metric tricks you can do. A lot of stuff about preparing data. Uh, customer lifetime value is also an interesting subject. And, but I'll stop there and see if anyone wants to ask a question now. Thank you. Do you have any thoughts on how to distinguish which of these features might be causal for churn or retention? Yes. Um, and it's maybe not the answer that people here are looking for, but I never use any kind of math or statistics to do it. I mean, it's usually obvious to, I mean, people who know the business, the product creators, the customer support people, they're all thinking about this, you know? So they're all gonna have their theories and hypotheses, and it's usually just pretty obvious what's causal and what's just, you know, correlative. Totally. Or to the extent that you can know at all, you know? Yeah, I think domain expertise can take you far. Yeah. <laughs> could, you, uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, windowing of the data? Mm -hmm. So uh, you presented a lot of metrics that are uh, time series, mm -hmm. and presumably before, uh, before comparing them, you have to define some, some window yep. and weigh it against uh, data that is maybe firmographic, demographic, something that's more of a state rather than an activity collection over time. Um, yeah, well, there's two things there. I mean, definitely the window that you choose is important. Um, and there's a lot about this in the book chapter. <laughs> um, the rule of thumb is if it's, a more, if it's a more rare event, you need a longer window, so you get measurements for more people. You know, it, if, it, if it's something that happens only rarely, you might want to measure it with like a six month or a 12 month window. In fact, if you're an annual product, annual subscriptions, you probably want to measure everything with a 12-month window. But then you've got the problem of what about new people um, on the platform? How do you get them a metric measurement quickly if you want to use a long window? And there's basically just a scaling trick. If you measure the count per month over a year, you can still call it a count per month, right? Just divide by 12. Then if you have a new person on the platform, you can make their count per month in just a month. It's still a count per month. You know, so it's basically making short window metrics for new people, long window metrics for uh, 
people who have been on for a while, and if it's a rare event where you really want a long window, and then you can just basically use scaling tricks, you know, linear scaling, um, to, make, to make them all comparable. Uh, you also asked about states, things like, well, demographics and, you know, industry. Um, they're almost always the least predictive of churn. Everyone goes into this thinking, oh, I want to know what industry or what demographic is my best customers. Behavior is always way more predictive. And if you do something like a backward selection, I mean, I do do statistics, machine learning, we do all that stuff. If you do a backward selection, it always chucks out um, the demographics and keeps the behaviors. And you just see, it's not, not always. I mean, there are some cases where you'll find like a good demographic or firmographic variable that explains a lot of churn. but. They're usually correlative. You know, you're like, oh, this industry group is churning more. And then you're just like, why? You know, what's special about them? It's not because, you know, they're drinking bad water in, you know, whatever their industry is. It's because, you know, they must be doing something. They have a behavior that's more common in their industry. And you want to get at that behavior, not just leave it at, oh, I'm bad with, you know, 35 to 45 year olds, you know, you want to be like, why am I bad with those people? What are they doing that the other people are not doing? You know, what fact about them can I get to that's not just their category? Is that all right? Yeah. Um, so for, uh, for behavioral changes specifically, though, right? Because like, if we're talking about behaviors, that's classifying a customer oh, as yeah. a type of thing. I am a high call customer. I am a low call customer. But early on, you talked about uh, the behavior change of a download. Oh right? yeah, I went yeah. from a high to a low, and that's probably personal to me because you know, ten Netflix shows per week is high for me, but it's low for someone else. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So but, how do you define those windows of change, and uh, how do you normalize across customers? Okay, right. Sorry, I didn't fully understand the question, but that is a really big area. Don't have time for it. But you make you make metrics of change. So guess what? If you make a one month window measurement, it's going to be highly correlated to a three month window measurement. But if you take the ratio between your one month measurement and your three month measurement. In, in finance, they call that a momentum indicator. It's basically just like the stock price today divided by the stock price a month ago. They call it you know, a momentum ratio. But yeah, you make ratios like that, and then you get uh, metrics of change that aren't strongly correlated with the underlying metrics. So it's another ratio trick that it's actually uh, this measuring change over time is a whole subject, yeah, in itself. <laughs>